Hi, introducing myself, I'm architect Himani Ahuja, country reporter at World Architecture Community and a communication specialist for, from India. Me and my team at One Digital in India creates cohesive communication strategies for architects, designers, and our lead brands, bringing together techniques, talents, and technologies, promoting them organically to gain marketplace momentum. This is a part of exclusive World Architecture Community's online interview series with eminent architects and designers world over. Introducing Manit, he's the founder of Morphogenesis, one of India's leading architecture and urban design practices with over 100 international and national awards. The firm has been published in over 850 international and national publications. He's a leading speaker in sustainable design, having lectured in numerous reputed universities and conferences worldwide. Manith has also co-authored Morphogenesis' first monograph, Morphogenesis, the Indian Perspective, the Global Context, published by Images Australia under their Master Architect series. His commitment to sustainable environments goes beyond the realm of architecture practice. We at WAC welcome architect Manith Rastogi. So, uh, welcome. Uh, let's explain us a bit more about how has Morphogenesis works and discourse changed during your 24 year career? How did you develop your design philosophy? So, well, first, thank you for the introduction. A minor correction, I didn't found Morphogenesis. I co-founded it with my partner, Sonali. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, since then, uh, you know, we're just uh, uh, amorphous, uh, uh, conglomerate of uh, 150 architects. So it's sort of, I'm just representing uh, the combined thinking of everyone here today. So, so you know, I assume that only one can speak on your uh, platform. Uh, so when we started Morphogenesis, uh, uh, when me and Sonali started it about some 24, 25 years back, uh, we had just come back from the Architectural Association. Uh, uh, I had completed my uh, uh, master's in sustainable design. I just finished my A diploma as well. Uh, Sonali had completed a master's in urbanism and uh, uh, and she also done another master's from uh, DRL, uh, Design Research Lab at DA. And when we came back here in 95, uh, 96, sorry, so yeah, 24 years, uh, we came back with the notion and the idea that uh, uh, what is uh, contemporary architectural discourse in this part of the world look like. We studied here before, we studied in the UK, we, and the A was sort of, you know, where a lot of people were coming and going through at that time. And there was a lot of talk about what architecture will achieve globally, but uh, predominantly there wasn't that strong a discourse coming out of this part of the world. So we came back here and we set up shop. Uh, and uh, we set up, uh, a, you know, our starting ideology, which hasn't changed that much, but has evolved, was based around uh, uh, nature. Um, and the argument really was that if, you know, nature does such a good job of what it builds uh, in terms of diversity, uh, sustainability, adaptability, interconnectivity, uh, all of the things that we strive for in architecture, then uh, what's wrong with the way we build? And uh, what can we work, what can we do by plagiarizing from the processes of uh, nature? And at the same time, looking back into a thousand or five thousand years of the evolution of architecture in this part of the world, and uh, to see how we can draw from the wisdom of the past using the technologies of the day to try and create an architecture of the future, which sort of uh, creates that sort of balance between uh, humanity and nature and where humanity does not sit on top of nature, but is an integral part of it. And that's sort of way we started. And uh, uh, over the years, uh, that philosophy has evolved. Uh, as we did more work, we began to understand the consequences of what we were doing. We, could, we began measuring uh, the, the performances of our building and performance not only in terms of uh, uh, you know, energy and you know, which we were doing, but also performance in terms of how these buildings were being used. So we ran a very strong program for nearly two and a half decades of post occupancy, which fast tracks to where we are today. Uh, and we, are, we follow a philosophy which we now 
uh, which has been copyrighted, uh, which is called SOUL, S-O-U-L, standing for sustainability, optimization, uniqueness, and livability. And we find that these are sort of the four pillars of uh, any form of architecture that uh, you know, you've sort of studied over the last thousand to five thousand years, like I was saying, that sort of entire period. And today, we've been able to put metrics of performance across all of them, uh, uh, which you know, may or may not apply globally, but definitely to a part of the world where resources are limited. And uh, there's a very high emphasis and always has been on livability, on uniqueness. Uh, you know, India is a very diverse country. This region is very diverse. Food is different. Languages are different. Clothes are different. Why should architecture be the same? Right. And what is that response of architecture to climate, to culture, to context, to and uh, so in that sense, a drift away from the sort of pure modernist idea, uh, optimization purely as a methodology of where can we limit the consumption of resources both in the production of architecture and its operation, and of course sustainability. And uh, yeah. And sustainability. So that's that's exactly you know uh, what I wanted to ask you next was you know all your design solutions are rooted to these four pillars, right? That we just talked about sustainability, optimization, uniqueness, and livability, right? So uh, Morphogenesis produces different types of projects in different geographies based on these four pillars. So do you think that uh, has the notion of sustainability changed? with the development of technology since you started your profession? So let me put it to you in another way. I think that, you know, by its very nature, uh, architecture has always been sustainable from the time it started. Right. Okay. And there's a, there was a period in time in between, I think, where uh, it sort of deviated from that path when uh, I think everyone sort of believed that there will be an abundance of energy and an abundance of water and an abundance of resources. Mm -hmm. And therefore it didn't really matter whether you were in a desert or in a cold climate, architecture did not need to respond to it. And what has happened uh, over the, and so, you know, uh, however, in this part of the world, touristically, we were, uh, we were adapting to that condition. Uh, uh, but what technology has done, and which has helped us enormously, is that we've been able to, simulated much before it's built. We're able to run what-if scenarios without having to actually physically build it and then wait for disasters or successes and then improve. And then to use technology to uh, uh, post-occupancy measure it and optimize the design uh, process itself. So what technology has really been able to do is to A, validate the heuristic, but B, compress time uh, to be able to produce architecture without really having to create, uh, to, uh, without having to experiment for flaws. Uh, right. so, you know, that, so that I think really has been the real success of technology and sustainability. Right, okay. Uh, do you work with craftsmen and local techniques in your projects? How do you think that architects can attain an ideal mix of this technology and tradition to design more efficiently now? So, you know, the, the, the challenge of technology has been that you know it's with the, uh, technology has been really good with dealing with data and when data gets structured it becomes information and when information gets structured it becomes knowledge and that's what technology is really good at and you know we're dealing with you know up to the point of knowledge but what it doesn't encapsulate is wisdom and that's where the role of craft comes in because craft has evolved through centuries of wisdom now when you now when you put uh, technology which is very good with dealing with, like I said, data, information, etc., and that can lead to a uh, that can lead to the production of architecture that is uh, highly responsive to the to what we understand. Craft brings to it an element that uh, that we emotionally connect to. Right. And and then and you know and I think and that's the real bridge, which is one of the reasons why we always push for uh, uh, for craft. It also goes to the fact that. One of our philosophies of architecture has been <clears throat> an architecture of almost somewhere. And, and that sort of comes from uh, us fighting against an architecture of nowhere, which means you can't, you know, the building would be anywhere in the world, or an architecture of somewhere, which we can't do anymore, which is a pure vernacular because of the requirements of buildings today. So we sort of sit somewhere in between. 
which we right. call an architecture of Volvo somewhere. And, uh, and that is sort of achieved by, uh, uh, you know, and so we've done this in several projects. Uh, uh, we did a large housing township, I remember about 15 years back in Bengal, <laughs> where the entire housing township was opened up to the local schools of architecture okay. to use as a canvas for auto sculpture, which wow. we would do okay. to date. Uh, we've done another uh, large project in uh, uh, Calcutta where all the vertical facades are handcrafted mm. in stone on the east and the west side, so that helps prevent the heat coming. But at the same time, it's sort of like a, it's a you know one of the world's largest urban canvases mm. at 100 meters high and 500 meters across, yeah. and a lot of the local craftsmen worked on that. Uh, we've also not, I mean, other than the arts and craft, we relied on local technologies. When we did the Pearl School of Fashion, and you know, we used earthenware pots, matkas, inverted them, and used them for insulation. Uh, right. All manufactured so fun functionally and aesthetically, it becomes like a mix. Yeah. It becomes a mix. A right. mix. That's correct. Right. Okay. Um, what kind of architecture do you foresee in India? Like considering now the pandemic and global economic fall down, what challenges does this bring? And you know, how do you think that architects should address them as? Well, considering we were the ones who created it in the first place, I think, uh, you know, uh, so I think what this pandemic has really done is that it's uh, given us a chance to reboot and rethink what we always knew to be right. right. Okay. Uh, so, you know, uh, I think that what will begin to fundamentally change is the, is the notion, I mean, you know, it's all about people, right? Now, now, cities, which are considered to be urban generators, now our cities are mega cities. Right. Okay, the big ones, and we've got 5,000 of them in India in total. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them, we are doing a couple of smart cities. But the question really about the city has been to bring a lot of people together, increase densities, go vertical, build central business districts, segregate the work areas from the living areas. Uh, and, in, and in that sense, uh, I think what we will begin to see uh, post-COVID is a decentralization of the mega city. I think we're going to see a lot of micro cities, polycentric, polynodal, uh, each one of a certain size that can, you know, that's sufficient for work, play, live, uh, mm -hmm. surrounded by green bug buffers with the next micro city, but interconnected. So mm -hmm. more a series, more like the brain. Right. Okay, where, mm -hmm. there, where a city is a neuron and is connected by synaptic loop. Mm. Okay, but it's always of a certain size, mm. and then you get the next one and the next one. But uh, rather than this sort of one singular entity, mm. uh, so I think we're going to see a lot of that. I think we're going to see fundamental changes in all the typologies as we know it. So, mm. you know, we've been filing for mixed land use for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and what are we doing today? So people are studying in their homes. They're using them as institutes. People are working in their homes. They're using them as offices. They're living in their homes. They're using their homes as gyms. They're using their homes for recreation. Mm. Okay. Now, this is a quintessential example of mixed-use living. Okay, yeah. It doesn't get better than this. And this is where the opportunity lies. So yeah. We have to rethink the office once again. We have yeah. to rethink. Uh, and, and what we will see come out of this, as you've seen every time we've hit a pandemic for the, you know, since the Spanish flu, or we've hit a global recession, what we will see, uh, we will see some typologies die or diminish. We will see mm. new typologies emerge in architecture. Mm. And I think it is for architects and designers, not only architects, yeah. to rethink the whole thing through. Mm. And, and, and uh, you know, nature has gifted us today a green slate. You know, it's, exactly. Uh, okay, and, and we can reevaluate every incorrect decision that we've taken to date in terms of how we think of our cities of our architecture and uh, and do the right thing and i think that's the opportunity that designers and architects have and i think and you know and specifically with india i think that opportunity is far better than anywhere else because a we are a very large nation of people but b we're also one of the world's youngest nations mm. so there is a lot yet to be done yeah so we we've literally been given like a clean slate to work on again so, yeah. That's right. Sure. 
Uh, so Morphogenesis has won previously like you know a lot of prestigious awards and it continues to do so you know they've published books, exhibited projects in local and international exhibitions and you know you've also been publishing some researches on urbanism and architecture. So uh, you know it's the firm itself is you know acting as an evolving uh, laboratory. So coming to my real question, what will be the biggest focus of morphogenesis for the future of architecture in the coming years? The future of architecture. I like that. <laughs> mm. uh, so, you know, we at a, at a very practical level, what we've done in these times. So, you know, we've been in lockdown for the last you know, couple, you know, month and a half. Yeah. Uh, and we do see that this condition is not going to change very much for the, you know, in the coming several months, maybe even a year or more. Uh, so what we have done internally is that we've broken up all our project teams into, uh, into thinking teams. Okay. So what we, and what we are doing is, so we're taking each typology. So let's take the typology of commercial buildings. Yeah. And we are now looking at it from scratch. We're questioning everything. So we are saying that if the 5,000 people who work in a building with, 20, uh, with lifts that carry 20 passengers, but no one's going to stop them, you know, there'll be no 20 people in a lift anymore. You know, the social distancing rules won't allow that. There'll be much lesser people on the floor plate. Then how do we begin to rethink vertical transportation? How do we move people in and out of, okay. uh, of, of high density buildings? Do the buildings themselves segregate? To, or are they interlocked buildings to vertical transportation course, you know? Uh, similarly, we're looking at uh, how do we bring natural ventilation back to uh, tight enclosed air conditioned commercial buildings. Okay, we're looking at alternative technologies. We're doing the same thing in residential design. We're looking at the at the fact that how does one space, a room, transform itself, like I was mentioning earlier, from being a school in the morning to being a uh, you know to being an office to being a gym. To, but yeah. the traditional home has been thought of as a bedroom, a living room, a kitchen, you know, a toilet, etc. Hmm. Now, that's not how we're using our homes anymore. Now, yeah. if, you, if you take that away and say, let's rethink the home, what does the home begin to look like? Where living is one part of it, not the only part of it. So right. we are working on that. So we are using this time, we're looking at education, we're looking at uh, urban design, we're looking at everything right now. And we think that the, so, our vision of the future is going to be an outcome of, of, of this exercise, mm. uh, which we are also trying to involve as many stakeholders as we can. The, okay. And across the country, different geographies, different climates. Okay. All so, right. yeah, so we're seeing very interesting outcomes. We're seeing outcomes and we're looking at them and saying, why didn't we think of that before? This is not about post COVID. This yeah. is about health, wellness, safety. Uh, it's about those issues. And those should be paramount in any case. And saying, look, yeah. it is possible to do it. So, so, so yeah, so we are, we're very excited about the future. Yeah, so basically you've got time to evaluate a lot of things and, you know, go back to, oh. uh, you know, creating a new history for everybody. So that's nice. Okay, lastly, what would you, uh, you know, give a message to young designers and architects before starting their own practice? Oh, so... If you have a good idea, there is no better time than to start now because you know, the world's your oyster. It's a new world. Yeah. And if you don't have a great idea, join a team who does because this is the time that you need to innovate. You need to go beyond business as usual. Business as usual in these times is really boring. I mean, yeah. Yeah, we're not going to get these times again. Once the stream picks up, or everyone will become an ace swim, you know, will become an ace swimmer in that, in that time. So take this time to do something really interesting, whether it's setting up your own or working in a team that does that. That would be my advice. Okay. All right. Thank you for your time. Looking forward to more interactive sessions with you in the future and happy designing. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you.